a, let's call it a happy skepticism about much of modern historiography, including everything written about Lyndon Johnson. Actually, on balance, I think it began to tip maybe 15 years ago. We've been getting some great work. And by the way, for the record, I support everything Robert Cato writes. He's terrific. How's your dad in self-protection? No, he hasn't interviewed me. And we're going to be long dead, Carol and me, by the time he gets to that volume. I can see Lyndon sitting up there smiling and saying, good. Let me come back to some of the inside mysteries of Vietnam, because that's the cross we bear. I've talked about this a little with my other poet, Harry McPherson, but Harry is a very private man, son of a bitch. The point is how much it still hurts. It took me three years to get to the Vietnam Memorial. Just last year, I ran into somebody who had been on the National Security Council staff, tucked away in one of the limitless number of offices in the executive office building. Who the hell knew who they were? He was very blunt. He says he still has nightmares. You have this terrible sense of failure. We fucked up. You can read every line of the great Haberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest. You can read every line of Bob McNamara's two volumes. You can read Hubert's autobiography. Yes, they tell the story, and no, they don't. I've talked to Doris Kearns about Lyndon Johnson's depiction of what happened, why, what he was trying to do, and what went wrong. To the best of my recollection, Doris is as dissatisfied as I am. I'm pretty well convinced that former President Lyndon Johnson never told the story as he would call it the true story. Lady Bird has come close, but in her delightful, elegant, mannered way, she slips it. I still don't know what we did wrong. I know enough about military strategies to know those failures. But I'm even more convinced of this. I was reading an op-ed in the Washington Post just this week by an old friend of mine, Gar Alperovitz a bomb thrower. They're my friends, the Dick Goodwins, the Adam Walensky's were Bobby. And Gar in September of 2002 is using the Tonkin Gulf incident to argue against invading Iraq. And he has two paragraphs which again state 
that what Lyndon Johnson really wanted was to conquer Vietnam, conquer Southeast Asia, blah, blah, blah. And my view including some very disturbingly intimate talks with the president late at night. Was that no American president from Lincoln onwards was more dedicated, is not the right word, more determined or his heart was in this struggle. Nobody wanted peace more than the President of the United States. Cy Vance and Harriman have both told me their side of the story, absolutely the same. Cy believed at a cocktail party in New York just a couple of years ago that Lyndon Johnson killed himself. Suicide, he said. And he used a big word because of the grief that he couldn't solve this problem. But not solving it is totally different from pursuing it every minute of every long waking day of a president. And don't forget, for every one of those days and every one of those hours, we had a mighty great society legislative program up and running and rolling. And this president never lost sight of that. The Califano office, the McPherson office, the Lee White office, they were not day-to-day -day intimately involved in Vietnam policy. They were making the great society work. How many votes have you got? That's what Larry O'Brien was doing. Counting votes, massaging, getting the, the, the House and the Senate behind all these mighty programs. We had the great triumphs of the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, 64, 65. The President's commitment to civil rights, to me, to most people I know and knew, was just as ironclad strong as it was in Vietnam. The shamefulness of this King family going on television a couple of years ago and still propagating in Atlanta, the Lyndon Johnson was part of a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King, it's an abomination. Of course, it's all about money. Because if they lose the name King, they're out of business in Atlanta at the shrine. But, Let me cover a, a track of developments. Beginning in the summer of 68, at some levels of our staff, we had a huge problem. Simply put, the President of the United States was not supporting the nominee of the Democratic Party. Ah. I don't know why he began to pick me out. We had been uh, deep in two or three major speeches. But with his withdrawal on uh, 
what was it, March 30th? April 30th? Uh, March 31st. March 31st. In June, <clears throat> I found myself so disturbed and angry, a lot of anger. which was a very uncomfortable thing to feel about the heroic figure in the Oval Office. My problem was Richard Nixon. I'm one of these Americans who, from the first time I ever heard of him, have always considered him to be a deadly, evil man. There are millions of us. I'm also, as I said, a New Yorker. So I had a hard-on for Richard Nixon. And I wanted to go get him. And I was in very close touch with the Vice President. And I was working behind the scenes with Larry O'Brien, who out of the DNC was running the campaign. The staff was, at the high level, very nervous about this. How do you push Lyndon Johnson into supporting Hubert Humphrey when he regards Hubert Humphrey as an enemy of Vietnam policy? Hubert, for his own reasons, self-interest, to get elected, began in the summer of 68 to slice and dice words, language. The party was at stake. But as the weeks and then the months went by, not only did we fail to have the president do some what we thought was some simple things. You're the President of the United States, you're the leader of the party, you're going to have to come out and criticize Nixon, tell the truth about Richard Nixon. And he refused to do it. All kinds of people began by phone and mail and meetings to the media began to get on the story. We had a very disturbing second and third stream of opinion, which columnists were, were beginning to write that Lyndon Johnson really preferred Nelson Rockefeller. Lyndon Johnson might actually prefer Richard Nixon because of Nixon's lying campaign promises I have a plan to end the war in Vietnam. We had this mysterious involvement of Claire Chenault. We had stories of money changing hands. It was getting very dirty. The troubles you brought home at night began to include the word loyalty. You can't serve two masters, not with the presidency and the Democratic Party at stake, not with Vietnam raging, the body counts growing every day. The President of the United States walking in and out of meetings with staff, members of the executive branch, strangers, pulling these damn body counts out of his hip pocket. He read them every twice a day. Whatever maniac suggested that to him or let him get away with it. I know Lady Bird hated it, but he was fixated on casualties.
So anyway, I can no longer recall the exact circumstances of, of a given week, but I finally reached the point where I asked to see the president, and I used a big word on a personal matter. <clears throat> It was a, a beautiful summer's day. I have an Okamoto photo of me. Sitting beside the president's desk in my Brooks Brothers poplin suit. Short haircut. Then I resigned. I remember giving him my reasons, which were all Nixon. I wanted to go to work for Hubert. <clears throat> it's the most amazing memory loss, and it happened instantly. I remember he lifted his head up and looked at me in a kind of a puzzled way and said, you don't want to do that. And I'm sure I tried to re-argue my basic point. And then he looked at me and he says, no, I need you here and the country needs you here. Then he gave me the look and he said, no. I don't know whether I expected anything, but I never expected no. I walked out, turned into the next door, Marvin Watson's office. He knew I was in there, probably knew why. And he looked up at me from the desk with a quizzical face and said, well, and I looked and I said, Marvin, and I turned my body around, I said, he turned me like a top. I don't know what he said. And Marvin looks at me and says, that's no. <laughs> so for whatever reason, uh, this was maybe June of 68, I went back to my office and went back to work. But I didn't give up on Nixon. By that time, I had almost maneuvered Harry McPherson into being right there with me. I say almost because Harry is so gentle, apart from being brilliant. And I was still angry at this very peculiar situation of Lyndon Johnson having never said a single word in support of Hubert Humphrey and against the Republican candidate. And I'm supposed to be a chief speech writer? Anyway, at that time, there was an all stops out effort to produce something called like a campaign film. And uh, there was a couple of versions came through from God knows where, and the president hated them. And he was right. Stock footage, parades, Harry Truman, FDR, JFK. So it was in limbo and one of the wonderful things about being a writer, there is such a thing as a muse, there is such a thing as inspiration, maybe divine, 
And one night I found myself sitting on my typewriter and I took the script of the film and began to rewrite it as a film script. But in the middle, after a two minute opening, the film cut to the President of the United States sitting at, the o sitting at his desk in the Oval Office saying to the people of America, Good evening, my friends. Four months ago, I resigned this office. But I'd like to talk to you tonight about what this office is. And I even say it to myself because so many other people in books have said it. It was amazing, Harry. In two hours, I wrote the best speech of my life. And at the end, it did have the big paragraph. Richard Nixon doesn't belong here. He doesn't have the character. <clears throat> I slept in my office that night. I remember about 6 a.m. going into that magnificent presidential bathroom where in the shower stall there were six shower heads and if that wouldn't wake you up you were dead. And I brought the speech up to Harry McPherson. It was written as a film script. I'll never forget Harry sat there with his tennis sweater on the chair, read it through, looked up my, at me in amusement and said, where did you learn to do this? And I said, I don't know. So what we agreed to was this, another great lesson of LBJ. Nobody was going to know about this. I was going to produce it, direct it, and bring it to the president in a can. Force his hand that way. This speech was so magnificent about the history of the American presidency that there was no way I knew that Lyndon Johnson was going to say no. He was boxed in. So I remember I called WCAU, the local TV station, got them to do something at night. I called Gregory Peck to do the narration. He called back in 10 minutes. He had laryngitis. <laughs> Very quickly I called the man known as The Voice, E.G. Marshall, West Side Apartment in New York. Delighted to do it. A day later, I got on a shuttle, probably took a cab, went to some studio somewhere in the west side of Manhattan, and we made the movie. No problem. We had a giant presidential seal. All it was was three minutes of party stuff, and the rest of it was his 22-minute speech. I got the film in a can, got back on the shuttle, came back to the Oval Office, and I'm very proud to say I put a note right on the aluminum film can and sent it right into the president. Let him worry about who the hell was going to show it to him. George Christian's book takes over at that point. He immediately called George. George arranged for viewing. <laughs> and we got it. He said yes. And George went the next step. He called in the White House press corps and he showed it to them. 
and they stood up and cheered. Honest to God. All those hard noses. And it aired. I think in October. Whether it helped or not, it was very late. Hubert had had his money turned off. A couple of years later, I had a long dinner with John Connolly, whom I had come to admire and kind of love a lot. And John indeed did confirm that Lyndon Baines Johnson had asked John Connolly to turn off the money. Ain't that amazing? When you think of the squeaker victory that Richard Nixon won. Why? Historians can give a bunch of reasons for every question, but surely the simple answer is Vietnam. Hubert is a liberal. I had trouble with him in 64. I've had trouble with him even though he's a great senator and a great supporter. He's a great progressive. But I don't trust him on Vietnam. So then comes the second answer. What am I really worried about? The history book. My legacy as Lyndon Johnson. And if, if Richard Nixon can win this war, all the better for me. Brutal stuff. The actual withdrawal speech might be just worth touching on because there have been so many versions talked about and written about, I suppose. My contribution is, at that time the president had basically, well, he had ordered that I was now the editor, the writer of last resort for everything. And we have been working that system for about six months. So I was at home this Sunday morning. McPherson, Clark Lifford, all the mysterious intelligence chiefs, John McNaughton at DIA. Everybody had been working on yet another major Vietnam speech, a bombing pause. We had reached draft 22. Every line, every paragraph was trashed out, argued about. Clifford was still kind of new in the Pentagon. Harry had finally, in my book, broken cover. And he was now nose to nose with the president in the bedroom at night. I don't know where Rostow was. So we had this major speech. Lady Bird, for the first time ever, took a hand, I mean, her own pencil, in about the last three drafts. So, it was damned important. She was running rehearsals on her own. To skip just a little bit ahead, Lady Bird Johnson was actually in 
the teleprompter room the night the resignation speech was to be delivered. In this little box of a room, the first lady, that's how intimately involved she was with this speech. Of course, for most of that Sunday, all of us but about five people believed that it was the big Vietnam speech. So my phone call was from the White House operator and she said the president wants you to come immediately to the Indian Treaty Room. I didn't even know where the hell it was. So I finally found it in the EOB. I walked into this magnificent 19th century room, long, long burnished table, and there were two or three men sitting at the table, and one of them was Horace Busby. I walked over, Buzz looked up, he motioned, and there was a speech folder, one of our regular black books, had a chair. I asked him, what's going on? I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember who the other two people were, but they weren't White House staff. <clears throat> I don't know. The lights were low, and I opened the speech book, and it's the Vietnam speech, which I am in charge of getting on the air for the required half-hour speeches, what, 27 and a half minutes or something? And I begin reading it for the 23rd time. And I'm coming through, and I found some ridiculous new quotation from John F. Kennedy, which I looked over a buzz, and I said, I'm striking that right now. I don't have the time for John F. Kennedy tonight. He just nodded. And I'm coming to the end of this book, and something occurs to me. There's too many pages left. And I cheated. I flipped to the end. Uh, and I think I got hit on the head by the ceiling. I was reading four or five pages in big speech typewriter face telling me that Lyndon Johnson wasn't going to run again. And that's how I found out. Knew nothing about it. Of course it gave me a hell of a problem because I now had to find an extra three and a half minutes in the speech for airtime. So I went back to my office had barely sat down when Jim Jones called and said, you're all to move up to Marvin Watson's office. Which I did. And there was this huge security clamp down. <laughs> no phone calls out, not even to your wife. I'm sitting there boiling. I guess angry is the only honest word. I was so pissed. I remember calling Art Oaken, our economic advisor, a gifted, literate economist for help in trying to cut some of the economic stuff. And Art came over, and this is true, I can still see this. My, I'm now using a typewriter in Marvin Watson's outer office. And as I went, with Art Oaken standing beside me, as I went to put my hands on the keyboard, my hands were shaking, and I couldn't type. And I think it was anger. It sure as hell wasn't fear. Clinically, it might have been shock. So we got the job done, the president came in about three o'clock.
didn't have much to say. I didn't say anything to him. Lady Bird was around, Clark Clifford was around. Got to be about four o'clock. And I took a break and went down to my office. And here's where Harry Middleton comes in, and Harry McPherson. And I sat there, probably still the rebel, And without too much thought, I picked up the phone. The hell with all these bureaucrats, their stupid secrecy. And I said, get me Mr. McPherson. He's probably on the tennis court. Ten minutes later, the phone goes and it's Harry. And I had written this out. I said, Harry, Charles, I'm in the office, and I'm only going to be able to say this once. He said, go ahead. I said, I believe you should be here tonight. And Harry's voice rose, and he said, Jesus, he's going to do it? I said, Harry, you should be here tonight. And I hung up. And then I called Harry Middleton and said the same thing, right? I also recall that maybe Harry Middleton and I shared another historic moment that night. Like many of the staff, I had serious toothache problems. We never got to a dentist. And someone had given me a bottle of Jack Daniels. And I kept it in my bottom drawer. I'm not a drinker, but that damn night, I know I drank, and I hope to hell Middleton did too. And if anybody was to ask Harry, I think he'd probably tell you, Jesus, Charlie was really mad. <laughs> the most moving Hours, of course, were after the speech. That famous, when he had finished the major speech, he had to turn a page. I was standing right behind him, off camera, of course, and Jim Jones was on my left shoulder. The teleprompter was running, there was a little pause, and the first words of the final section came up. <coughs> <coughs> and Jim and I have both agreed. <coughs> and I talked to Lucy, no, I talked to Linda Bird <coughs> also about this. When he opened his mouth and spoke the first lines, there was a gasp. Two of the Signal Corps people had their mouths open. Clifford was standing over to the right. It was so hard to believe that he was actually sitting there you know, a hand span, an arm's length away, basically retiring. Hell of a moment. <coughs> I need to change the time. Okay.